I had the privilege of having this discussion with uh, Mahmoud Farma. So uh, Mahmoud, you're an intelligence and security analyst, uh, as well as a politician in, in Norway. And your background, uh, your, your personal background is Iranian, which is, I think, quite an interesting combination. Uh, did, you, did you manage to see the talk earlier that uh, uh, Masih Alinejad gave? And, and what was your reaction to that? Uh, how are you doing, Thor? It's great to be here. I, I saw Masih's talk. It was very interesting and quite intriguing. She has a wealth of detail and uh, it's interesting to listen, listen to her talk in such uh, engagement about the issue. My parents were themselves uh, dissidents in Iran and that's why we, we left the country. Uh, so it's interesting to see that the fight carries on and people are still working hard to restore democracy and freedom in Iran. Yes, well, it's definitely a truth that those of us who are either in exile or descend from people who are exiled certainly have a sensibility and an understanding that sometimes people who are born in, in free countries don't have with regard to how regimes operate. And, and I guess this brings me to, to, the, to the subject of uh, what you're going to be addressing. Um, intelligence agencies across Europe uh, confirmed on an ongoing basis that governments should be warned about the activities of China. And I, I wanted you to give some specifics on that. I mean, you and I talked about this online, and I thought it would be interesting to, have, to hear some more about this. Um, intelligence agencies in Europe have, for the last five, six years, warned policymakers, firms, uh, and the public in general about China's presence in, in Europe. Um, they have been quite clear that the the issue with China is complicated and they've been quite, quite specific. They've mentioned that Chinese intelligence is, is out there to, to gather uh, to gather information about the uh, about the technology, uh, to gather uh, specifics on policy making and to influence the decision makers in their favor. Uh, we've seen the Norwegian intelligence agencies do that. The Dutch have done so. The, the Danish have done so. And late, the, the last thing that happened was the other day that the British intelligence agencies went out there and, and also warned of this issue. Um, so, so there are clear indications that intelligence agencies around Europe are, are worried about the Chinese presence. And they're doing what they can to warn the people uh, of, their, of the way the Chinese operate. Define to me Chinese presence. I mean, what do you mean? I mean, there, there's, I mean, people have, what does that actually mean? How does that manifest? It, it manifests itself through the, uh, the, the use of uh, anything from uh, Chinese intelligence uh, operators, uh, intelligence officers to, to Chinese firms and even Chinese students. Uh, a few years ago, if I'm not mistaken, China passed a bill that, that said that any Chinese uh, uh, citizen uh, be it at home or abroad, is obligated to help the Chinese state. Uh, so you can imagine when you have a, uh, a group of Chinese uh, PhD students at a Norwegian university researching anything from uh, nuclear power to, to salmon uh, fishing and what, what, whatnot, what kind of threat that, that, pre that presents for the Norwegian uh, government. And we also see the same thing in, in the in the so-called private firm, uh, which, which we can talk more about later. So most, this is interesting, most people uh, remember 10 years ago, the no Norway's uh, Nobel Peace Prize Institute awarded the Nobel Peace Prize to a Chinese dissident, uh, Lu Xiaobo. What most people don't realize is that immediately after this, the backlash from the Chinese government was ruthless. And the backlash was uh, against Norway in general, against Norwegian citizens, against Norwegian companies. It was an all out assault from the, Nor from the, from the Chinese government against all things Norwegian because of the prize. And, and there's, I bring this up because there apparently, I mean, there seems to be a misunderstanding. It, and this is not exclusive to the Chinese dictatorship alone, that when something occurs in a civil society, such as, the Nobel Peace Prize, which is not a government prize, it's not handed out by Norway, it's handed out by a private institution in Norway. But dictator, a dictatorship would, would recognize this as they are doing this to us, they are all doing this to us. They don't seem to have 
uh, to see a difference between the private sector and the public sector, between what the government does and what people in general or institutions or cultural institutions do. And I, I'm wondering, does this also translate internally in China? Do they see no difference between themselves and the private sector? And, and how does this manifest abroad? And I'm going to bring this back to the coronavirus in a moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just, uh, what you're saying there is quite interesting because the Norwegian intelligence agency, the Danish and so on, they have also warned of this. The lack of uh, difference or the lack of distance between the Chinese intelligence agencies and the Chinese so-called private firms. And they're quite, uh, they stated quite clearly uh, that, that uh, they don't go as far as saying the Chinese intelligence agencies, but they say that some countries' intelligence agencies uh, help their private firms in, in, uh, in conducting uh, so-called uh, business-like transactions. Private firms are used to, to conduct the intelligence operations. Um, the, 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 one has to understand one thing with China. It's, it's, I, a few of your speakers have said that earlier, but I want to emphasize it, that the, in order to start a larger firm like Huawei or Alibaba or whatnot, one has to be connected in China. It's not done uh, by, by mere accident. It's not done by pure luck. You have to be connected to, to be able to start a firm. This is a, this is a communist uh, one-party system you're talking about. Uh, if they don't want you to allow a company to, to thrive and survive, they will not let you do that. And hence, you, one, one becomes uh, in debt to the, to the government and to the intelligence services and so on. I see, well, actually, uh, you know, the, the, there's, there's a funny joke. I can't remember the movie that was in. It's a, China's intelligence agency is so secret, so secret, and so widespread. No one, you know, Brit Britain has MI, MI5, MI6, American has CIA, NSA, um, uh, you know, but nobody knows the name of the Chinese intelligence agency. <laughs> you're, you're, you're quite right. When, when you talk about Chinese presence in cyberspace, one just talked about the AP, APTs, uh, which is uh, Advanced Persistent Threat. That's what you call them. While, while other countries have a name for their cyber capacities and intelligence agencies, the Chinese just go, go by the normal everyday names. So how does this uh, private sector, public sector, government like Borg, how does it, um, how does it manifest like in your experience in the Nordic countries or in Scandinavia? How, how have, you, have you seen that presence? Uh, that, that presence, I mean, uh, it's, just, it's quite, it manifests itself in several ways. Um, one thing is that uh, many European countries, including Norway and Denmark and uh, the Dutch, I believe it was, passed a so-called, just passed the security bill. And the, the security bill uh, says something about so-called critical infrastructure, uh, which is the uh, telecom sector, railways and so on, that, that this should not be put in the hands of foreign powers, such as China, such as Russia. Uh, because the fact is the, the Chinese intelligence agencies or Chinese private firms um, use, uh, to put it this way, Chinese intelligence agencies will use Huawei's access to the Nordic telecom sector in order to gather intelligence for themselves. Uh, and, and this is a fact. So we have had a, a quite difficult issues here in Norway on the uh, expansion of the 5G net for example, where we see that the, 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 the Chinese uh, telecom uh, company, Huawei wants to get into it, it is, but we cannot let them. And we see the pressure, pressure that is indirectly, in this case, uh, exerted by the Chinese embassy and Chinese uh, officials. This is well, quite clear and quite evident. And we saw, just to put it this way, during this corona crisis, we've seen the Chinese ambassador to Norway and other places in Europe, write news articles where they, amongst other things, talk about this. Another issue, if I'm going to discontinue, is the fact that uh, Huawei uh, was quite active in delivering so-called help to, to, the, to the Dutch, to the Netherlands, during this corona, corona crisis. But that was because, it, it's, I'm not going to go and say it's, it's, it's a direct link, but it's easy to assess it. To the fact that the Dutch are going to go out there and have a contract or competition on who's going to build their 5G net. I see. I see. So they're they're using, in, in your experience. I mean, my, my sense is you you can't really have a large company in China unless you are, have members of the Communist Party or the children of the leadership involved in your company. Uh, the the gathering of the Chinese Communist Party 
is without question the world's largest gathering of billionaires. I mean, at the end of the day, it, it, it is it is just the, the vast amounts of wealth held by the leaders of the of the Communist Party of China is is something so staggering. Um, and, and there's even a term for the children of these leaders. They call them the princelings. And they are the ones, you know, there, there are so many Western companies. If you wanted to operate or have access to China, you needed to put someone from one of those families into, into the board. So, which is rather ironic considering they are supposed to be uh, communist which I, I, and, and not some kind of oligarchy, but an oligarchy is, is definitely what they've become. But so, so this, so for instance, Alibaba donated a, a whole bunch of masks and, and you have the Chinese officials all over the world encouraging um, people in government to pass resolutions to recognize how hard China has worked to eliminate the coronavirus. In, in fact, a state senator in the United States publicized that he received a resolution from the local Chinese consulate that they wanted him to pass locally about how China should be recognized. So they're, 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 they definitely have all of their misinformation campaign, all of their PR campaign operating at all levels. Can you, can you tell me what is, what is their goal in, in terms of their foreign policy goal when they engage in activities like this? Um, the Chinese legitimacy of the Communist Party internally in China depends on how they're perceived abroad. Um, we, we see this quite evidently after China and... Wait, wait, so, 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 so what, you're, what you're saying is that their, their, their internal survival is yes. dependent on, their, on how in, internally perceive themselves externally. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. I mean, how, how China is perceived abroad in exile or European countries is, is, is quite uh, important to them in order to be able to survive internally, um, internally amongst their own populace, because it's, it's like any other dictatorship. We see this in Iran, we see it also in Russia. Their success is measured in how well perceived they are among Western countries or among their neighbors. Um, and, and we see this quite uh, clearly in, in the, when, when Norway and China normalized their relationship, there was a contract signed signed between Norway and China, where, where point three in this contract says something like, Norway is to support Chinese uh, efforts uh, and not to do anything to harm these interests and always talk positively of China, which is quite interesting because you, you're not able to criticize the country uh, and you're not able to in any way uh, hamper their, their expansion. Uh, but, but, but as you, as you mentioned, the, the, in, for, China, for the Communist Party and, and for China, the, the, for, for the Chinese, the, for China as a country, uh, it's important to be liked abroad because that is how they uh, are, how, how they uh, le legitimize their, their use of force internally. How, how they, their, their, their amount of success abroad is what, what, what shows how, how well they're doing internally. That's how this hang, uh, hangs together. I mean, my experience of this is they are deathly afraid of criticism at in the in the cultural field. So they the Chinese government has purchased uh, or made investments in hedge funds or venture capital funds or or direct investments in so many different um, entertainment companies around the world, entertainment companies in 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 the United Kingdom, entertainment companies, in Europe and a lot of entertainment companies in the United States. There are a lot of funds that provide um, money for film that are Chinese um, Chinese funded, and as a result, you will probably uh, it will be very difficult to find a narrative film, a Hollywood film that is critical of China, a Hollywood film that is that is pointing out human rights violations in China. There aren't very many of those, um, uh, and film festivals are loath to uh, include films that either documentaries. Uh, that address human rights issues in China. I guess that must be part of their, um, in, in, in many ways, they're seeking to have some kind of cultural hegemony when it comes to never allowing criticism, which contrasts very dramatically with democratic countries. You, you, in the United States is probably criticized more than any other country in movies constantly. It's always the bad guys in the government or it's, it's, it's something along those lines. You will not find that. It's very difficult to find a body of Hollywood films that address the subject. So it, it, it gels with what you're saying about how their internal stability and their internal control depends largely on how they are perceived abroad. 
They're very sensitive to that. They must be hating COVID con. They really must not be liking this. Uh, not not only that they're not liking this, I think they're losing sleep over this because because this these kind of I mean COVID con is 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 uh, showing uh, all the lies, all the seats, and everything they've done. Um, just do a comparisons here, Thor. Look look back to the seventies and the eighties. Uh, how many Hollywood movies were made about Russia, the Soviet Union, but where we criticized them? Absolutely. So, so I, 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 I was watching a movie the other day about of course, a Hollywood movie with the Chinese uh, theme in it. No criticism, nothing. Everything is glorious, fantastic. Look at this great thing. And of course, the Chinese culture, the ancient co Chinese culture, has to be respected. I do agree, but one cannot, in that context, not criticize the Communist Party, which is deliberately hiding stuff, which is in, in the way they've, they've handled the COVID and a lot of other issues are harming the world, are harming the population of the world, and how they're through their uh, use of power, both soft and hard power, are pressing free governments into shutting up. And th yeah, this, is, this I mean, is basically what they're doing. But what you're pointing at is it's, it's very accurate. I mean, there were, there were always, for years during the Cold War, there was uh, a, 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 you know, the good guys and the bad guys. and and the the uh, entertainment industry was very good at demonizing yeah, yeah. the, the exactly. Soviets and and having a stark contrast, um, or or if not that, you know, films about the Second World War. We've never seen that with China, and and, and China yeah. always comes back with you're criticizing our culture as if control by the Communist Party of China equates to China's historic you know background and origins. Um, what they are, I mean, ultimately, they are a group of billionaires, a large group of billionaires, a criminal gang that through force, no elections, prison camps, re-education, lack, uh, lack of freedom of speech, complete censorship, have maintained control of that enormous country and have spent so much of their time stealing technology and doing all sorts of things uh, to prepare themselves to essentially try and achieve some kind of military superiority so that they will never, ever be challenged internationally. So it, it's, it's... Sorry to interrupt you, Thor, but, but you're mentioning something about culture and criticism. What we saw in the beginning of this COVID situation that we're, we are in, the countries that closed their borders to Chinese flights or China flights from Wuhan, they were all, all accused of racism. Right. Italy was uh, accused of racism. Uh, Chinese. Some yeah. other countries. Yeah, and, and this is this, and the same thing happened here in Norway. A, a editor in chief of a newspaper wrote a Chinese critical article, uh, and the Chinese ambassador in Norway uh, went out there and wrote an article where he accused Gunnar Stavrum of racism. That's quite interesting. And this, this shows that they, they, they are no, in no way uh, able to accept criticism, and they're in a lot of ways using the this this uh, identity politics of the West against ours, against ourselves, dividing us and cutting us into pieces. Uh, and they're doing it quite cleverly. So, so let, me, let me go into some of the questions that are, that are being asked here. Um, do, do you think that there could be a new Cold War between the West and, and, and China? Um, are we already in a Cold War with, with China? And we are already, we are already in a cold war. Uh, the, the issue is that if if China has the financial muscles after this issue uh, to continue this cold war, we see the Japanese are now planning to get home a lot of the industries that they have in yes. China. European we, countries are talking about the same issue, and this is the best way to hit the Communist Party is to take away the the, the, the financial uh, abilities. The same thing with the, with the Soviets take away their financial uh, possibilities and abilities, and then they will, they will rot from the inside and out. Uh, I'm, I've got another question here from, from Robert. Uh, post COVID, will EU governments be more skeptical of using entities like Huawei, which is essentially, as you mentioned, a state-owned entity, a state-controlled entity to build sensitive strategic infrastructures like 5G? Uh, I think we're already getting there because we see that a lot of companies in Europe right now are, are seeing the fact, and governments as well, that, that being dependent on China is costly. It costs more than uh, one could imagine. And being dependent on Chinese uh, companies to deliver uh, sensitive infrastructure or key infrastructure is, is going to be quite, quite di difficult. 
Uh, and uh, I think we're going to see a, a renationalization of a lot of uh, value chains and a lot of uh, logistical chains uh, and also infrastructure. That's going to happen, if not as a nation, but within the EU or, or within the Western Hemisphere. So uh, I, um, you know, that that person who asked the question, J initials J A, they they also asked if if China would ally in that case with Turkey, Hungary, Poland, and Serbia. And and someone else asks a, a different question related to that. Eastern European nations like Hungary uh, and Poland and others will not side with China. You can bet the farm on this. This is John speaking. After being repressed by communism for decades. They will resist China at every step of the way, but we're not really seeing that in the case of Hungary. We are not seeing that, but we have to we have to understand. I mean, even Hungary and Poland, they're dependent on financial development, uh, and if China cannot give that to to them, and EU can, then then they will go towards the EU. They they might they will go their own way, but they will be it will be easier for them to cooperate with the EU. Um, and I think uh, I'm going to kind of it's difficult to say because I think China is dependent on uh, the Western European countries and their, their financial means. That, that's what it's all about. Hungary and Poland cannot deliver that financial uh, means that, that China needs or production capacities that China is dependent on. Hence, even though they might, might want to cooperate with China, it depends on what yes, China so wants to do. In that sense, they're bit players. They're, they're, it's not going to matter. Uh, it's it's not going to matter if they if they do or don't ally is what you're saying. And and and, and Hungary and Poland are going, also going to look at countries like Iran that are cooperating with China. What happened to Iran during this COVID crisis? What has happened to Iran, or, or African countries for that sake, for that matter? China has used th these countries as modern colonies, and colonizes these countries uh, quite rapidly and quite efficiently empties them for their for their resources uh, and we saw how they what did they do to Iran during this COVID crisis right now as as, as, as we we're standing in the middle of it. Uh, Iran criticized China and got a reprimand both financially and politically. So if Hungary and Poland are looking to these countries and see what happens to them they will know that this is not the way to go. So I have a question from Rodrigo. Uh, what do you think well there's two questions let's just take the second one. What do you think China is trying to do with all this surveillance? But more importantly, they will expect the world to forget this crisis and consider themselves heroes. Do you think that the efforts that they're making, either by you know get donating masks or um, showing off over and over again the the really extraordinary measures that they've taken now at airports, for instance, to protect themselves against the virus and, and to claim that everything is clean and that it was you know the virus was was born somewhere else or was caused by another country. Do you think that they are going to get away with it, either internally or externally? Or do you think the world is, that it's the cat is out of the bag, that ship has sailed and they will be unable to lie about it? Um, if I'm gonna base myself on the, the human ability to have a short-term memory, I would say that everybody will forget about it. The, the problem here is that even though China might have, might, might have a great influence in Western Europe and Europe in general, uh, the, the populace will not forget this. The, the human costs of it, the financial costs of it will not be forgotten by the populace. Um, they might be able to control it internally with 1984 style ta tactics and techniques, but externally we see that they're struggling, seriously struggling. And what one sees is that people, people or countries are, have ca caught on to this. They, they sent a lot of faulty test equipment to Italy and the Netherlands. They sent uh, right now. That you mean right now they're sending faulty equipment to? to they are sending. They are still sending faulty equipment. Yeah, the irony but of that is so rich. And people are seeing through it. I mean, the, the, the governments are seeing through it. The interesting thing is the German Minister of Health was out there yesterday was and said that we send more equipment to to Italy than anybody else, but we don't make a commercial huge thing out of it. We do it because we are brother nations. We, we are cooperating about on this issue, while China is doing this, that, and the other. So one sees that the officials in the EU or in Europe are catching on to China. Uh, but we need to stand together. It's quite important that the Western world, even though Europeans disagree with Boris Johnson, Europeans disagree with uh, with with uh, Trump, we have to stick together through this. Uh, we could disagree, but we have to stick together against a tyranny like China. Well, Mahmoud, I, I think uh, I think we I think we're pretty much done. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to mention for, for for the sake of it because I think it matters. Um, 
Do you know much about how how the Uyghur people have have been affected by the current COVID crisis inside China? Do you know much about that? I mean, there's more than a million of them in concentration camps. I, I can imagine it's it's um, just appalling. But I, I don't know that much. We've been trying to get information out, and and our Uyghur our Uyghur contacts don't have that much like uh, factual stuff to give us. I don't I don't know all that much about it, but I can only imagine what is going on. Uh, with the fact that we don't know that much about the numbers in China, I would imagine that the minorities like the, like the Uyghurs are, are hardly hit and nobody's talking about it and we'll never hear about it. That, that's you mean the hit hard, part. not hardly hit. You mean hit. Oh, hard. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mahmoud, thank you so much. This has been great. Thank you for your time. Really appreciate your insights. Great to be here.